During the question and answer period, if you have a question, please raise your hand and make the question brief and to the point. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Sharon from Los Angeles. Good morning. I'm Sharon Crane, alcoholic. Thank you. I'm still getting used to my new name. Um, thanks for asking me to do this. It's always it's always fun for me to do my research. You know, that's that's what I I love. Um, uh, I just love the writings, the old grapevine writings and some of the books we have. We even read Pass It On last year in my baby meeting. It was, it was like, we found a lot of fun in it. And um, one year we did the concepts. I have a baby meeting once a month, so we did the concepts. And we were always calling New York. It was fun. We were like little rebellious asking lots of questions. So I like digging into the AA literature a little bit more. And so that's my fun. So thank you for that. And um, I just love so many of you this morning. And you're my type of drinkers. <laughs> You'd be missing an hour. I'm up anyway. You know, it's like <laughs> so this springing ahead thing can affect us. And I've got, you know, thanks to Chris and Barb here, I've got three liquids, which make me feel very comfortable. Um, <laughs> whether I open them or not, you know, usually when I crack the lid, I, ha I, I like always want to toss it. I have to help myself from tossing the lid of anything because I never <laughs> needed the lid, you know. So we haven't cracked it yet, so <laughs> I'll, try, I'll try to behave this morning. Um, anyway, uh, you know, I just, I, I um, one of the things uh, my uh, girls that we do too is we, you know, we talk about where we are and what we're trying to, how we're trying to be part of the force for good a little bit more in the world. And it seems to come up that, you know, emotional sobriety is something that, uh, it's a constant struggle. It's um, a constant letting go. It's a constant, um, you know, it's baby steps. And I'm just so glad that we uh, <laughs> progress, not perfection. Absolutely. And, and I told you a little bit about me last night. I'm very independent. I'm extremely independent. I'm the one that I can just put a pack on my back and go somewhere and start over life, you know. Sometimes I'd even change my name temporarily just to have some fun with it. I still do that at Starbucks. I, just to be bad, I'll give a different name. And then when they start calling out Cindy Lou, Cindy Lou, that's one of my aliases, Cindy Lou, and uh, that's when I was seven. And, um, <laughs> I, I, the, you know, I go, where's my coffee? And then I go, oh, that's right. I was being bad today. I forgot, you know. And So I, I'm... Um, you know, I like to reinvent myself when I was out there drinking, definitely, because I was never enough, absolutely never enough. So, you know, this isn't, I just want to start with this. This is one of uh, Bill's writings in Language of the Heart, uh, which is conference approved. Um, and he talks about his stability came out of trying to give, not out of, out of demanding that I receive. And thus, I think it can work out with emotional sobriety. If we examine every disturbance we have, great or small, you will find at the root of it some unhealthy dependence and its consequent unhealthy demand. Let us, with God's help, continually surrender these hobbling demands. Then we can be set free to live in love. We may then be able to 12-step ourselves and others into emotional sobriety. And I love it the way he uses the words hobbling. You know, it doesn't talk about, you know, just kind of tripping. It's hobbling, <laughs> you know, and... Uh, you know, I, I uh, definitely know that the one thing I have to do 100% is stay physically sober, 100%. You know, there's no, there's no line in the sand to move there. You either are or you aren't. So the physical sobriety is there's no move in that line. Um, you know, but it's funny with, with alcoholics. Um, I've known a few of us over the years. We have a tendency to kind of roll over that line in the middle of the night and go, oh, here it is. Yeah, no, I can act this way. And... And, uh, you know, it's, we, I used the word this morning, it's kind of like tapering on the bad behavior, little by little by little, that nickel and dime kind of um, uh, a dishonesty. You know, Steve read it, you know, it's, you know, grave emotional <laughs> disorders. But, you know, we can recover if, we, if we're honest. And it doesn't say that, you know, sometimes you're honest or once in a while you should be honest. You have to live honestly. And, and um, I, I, uh, I had that line moving a lot when I was early in my sobriety. And I remember the first time I told a lie and I heard it, a lie I had been telling for 20 years. And I heard, as I walked away from this guy in our home group, his name was Ramon. He didn't speak English. He didn't speak Spanish. We didn't quite know what he talked. But um, everybody loved him, and he was kind of like anchored the room in the back. And, you know, if somebody said something he thought was, you know, a little out there, he'd just sit in the back of the room and go, really? 
You know, he'd always, oh, Ramon, you better behave, Ramon's paying attention, you know. He could understand you, he couldn't really speak it, but, you know, he just had those eyes that seemed to, to make you, okay, that's right, Ramon's watching. You know, he had to shape up. He was a great guy in our home group. And, and I told this lie to Ramon, I was in my first year, and, and it was a stupid lie, but it was a lie that was, you know, we have to kind of get back to the root of things sometimes. It's not just the surface. Um, why, you know, it's, 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 you know, why do I keep telling this lie? Well, the reason I kept telling the lie, I found out, was because I never got to say goodbye to my grandfather in the hospital, my favorite grandfather, who my son is named after, uh, who taught me how to fish and swear and spit. Um, you know, just a great guy, and I never got to say goodbye to him. I was a freshman in college. He was two blocks away from me. I was too high. I was too loaded. I was down at Joe's place, and I didn't go to the hospital to say goodbye. And I felt really bad about that. From that point on, I had been telling this lie. And um, so I just, so I guess it wasn't 20 years. See, I just exaggerated there. So it must have been, so I was 17 then, and I got sober in, in uh, okay, 25, 26. I was about 26. So, okay, I've been telling the lie for 11 years. There you go. Corrected it. I just heard that. That's good. That's good. And he said, I like that watch. I had this like pocket watch I wore around my neck. And I said, oh, yeah, my grandpa, Wesley, my favorite grandpa gave that to me. And I walked away from Moan, and I could feel his eyes in the back of my head. You know, I could hear him under his breath go, really? You know, and it's like, I just knew, you know, I just knew. Why am I telling this lie again? Why do I tell this lie? And I just, I got to tell Ramon, I'm lying. And I just, I was so afraid. I think I circled the room, I don't know how many times. And finally, I went back in front of him and I said, Ramon, I got to tell you, this is a lie about my grandfather. And he said, I know. It's like he never even let me tell the story. I know. It's okay. You don't have to tell that lie anymore. You know, he didn't want to know why. He just said, it's okay. You don't have to tell that lie anymore. And so it was like I was set free from something. I was set free from, you know, the, the pain of not saying goodbye to my grandfather and having to have something to clutch on to because I felt guilty and tell this silly lie about this watch that... Um, you know, didn't um, didn't have any connection at all. And uh, anyway, I was set free by by hearing, by seeing, by being aware. And I was probably about nine months sober. And that's the one thing I loved about Chuck. He used to talk about you don't see till you see, you don't hear till you hear. You know, I can tell you there's books in that bookcase. And you'll go, no, there's not. There's no book. What are you talking about? There's no books in that bookcase. And then one day you walk in and you've done a little bit of step work and you're out of yourself a little bit. You're, you know, the blinders are off and you go, oh. Huh. There's books in that bookcase, you know, and it's like, oh, thank God. <laughs> and I love working with new people because you can say the same thing over and over and over and over again. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. And then one night they wake you up at midnight because they've been at the coffee shop, you know, Sunday night, midnight one. You know, I'm going to work tomorrow. What are you calling me so late for? You're going to drink? No, but I have to tell you this. And they, they reiterate what you just had been telling them for six months. And they said... Guess who spoke at Ohio Street? And guess what I heard? You know? And it's like, <laughs> and you want to say, I've been telling you that for six months. But it's just like, I just always, when, I, when they get it, I'm so happy that they get it. And they finally see, they finally hear, whatever it is that's been kind of working its way. And I just, thank you. Thank you. Because, you know, we never know where we're going to hear something or see something. And that's why... That's why when I talked, Barbara and I were talking about this morning, when I go out in the world, I have to be, you know, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, whether you're watching or not. And I like to have sightings of people out in the world. I call them sightings, you know. And, and um, I like to watch them a little bit before I go say hello. As people said, I was watching you before I came to say hello, so it's okay, you know. Turnaround's fair play here. But I, I love having those sightings out in the world. And, and I remember being on a crowded, crowded elevator, and, and this per one more person got on. You know, we're stopping at every floor. We're taking the local, you know, and I'm late for a doctor appointment in the building. And, and so we're every floor. And the last floor, somebody gets on, and, and, you know, they're bigger than they should be and taking up too much room. <laughs> And, and as they got on, I had to move back, and, and I got my toes stepped on. And it was like, oh, I was just, I was ready to go, and I literally, you know, I had to just kind of go like this. And uh, as, you know, people started getting off the elevator with different floors, there in the back of the elevator was this new guy I had met at the, <laughs> the night before, and he tapped me on the shoulder, and I just thought, oh, I'm so glad. 
I'm so glad I didn't go off, you know, and because, you know, everything, I, you helped me so much last night. Would he have said that if I would have gone off on somebody else who would say, oh, that person's crazy. I'm going to disregard anything I got from that meeting. Um, so, you know, I acted better than I felt, and that's been a lot of my freedom and into emotional sobriety. You know, Carl Jung talks about, you know, I think it's in There's a Solution, about um, emotional rearrangement that he thought was very necessary um, for helping this alcoholic and until he saw that we needed to have spiritual awakenings and spiritual experiences. And, and, uh, but all of that, that awakening has given me some sort of emotional rearrangement. I, um, <laughs> I, I, went, um, I, I drive in L.A. I'm, I mean, there's a lot of freeway and there's a lot of insanity, and you just got to let it go. I mean, it's, um, I'll be talking to some, somebody on the phone, and they'll be, hey, get out of my way. And it's like, <laughs> are you talking to me or them, you know? And, it's, you know, it's, and of course you got to be on a headset, I say. Everybody who's on the phone in the car better be on a headset, you know, no holding this or you pull over. Yeah, I'm riding, holding the phone and doing my eyebrows all at once, you know, and, but, um, you know, it's just, it's so, it's just, you got to let it go, Betty. You know, you drive a big old Mercedes, everyone's going to get in your way, you know, it's, um. And uh, But I was on the freeway one morning, and I was very calm and having a really good morning, and I had just done my readings and had my, um, you know, my little emotional sobriety morning with my meditation and feeling really good about life and sunny day, and I'm in my car, and uh, I get cut off. Whoa! Last night there was not one. So is that your new liver or kidney calling? Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, the new um, the the um, the car. This it was an, it was uh, I had you know my car and I'm feeling really good and it's it's a it's a beautiful day and my, I think my windows were down. It wasn't even air conditioning time and and this lady pulls in front of me and she cut me off to get on the freeway on ramp. And she's a little old lady from Pasadena, blue hair, uh, you know, every little clip earring in place, uh, every little hair in place. Um, and I could hear her radio station, which was like elevator music, you know. Something called K-Joy used to be a station we had down there, K-Joy. And it was all mellow music. And she's like in my way, cutting me off, not even going, can I, excuse me, can I, you know, didn't even ask. Um, and uh, I just thought, how rude. And then I'm, I'm thinking, you know, well, you know what? These people that are in retirement, obviously, should not be on the road between 7 a.m. and 10 a.m. <laughs> they just should not. They should be like those big trucks. They can't go to work or they can't go on the road until, until the freeway trap, until we die down. Us workers, get out of my way. And she just was in like something like a Valiant. I don't even know if I could know that car. And she gets on the freeway ramp, and so I buzz around her, you know. I'll show her. Um, so I buzzed around her, and, and uh, she's not even waving. No, she's just smiling. It's like, I, and I'm on the road, and then everybody's in my way. Everybody starts to irritate me a little bit. Um, all those nice, wonderful things I just thought about you and the world are gone, and it's me first, you never, out of my way. And um, so I'm adopting that attitude, and I'm... I get to my off ramp, which isn't that far down, right? And I am sweating, and I need I need a nap. I mean, I'm tired. I need a nap. I'm exhausted. I haven't even I can see my building, but I got a ways to go, and I need to turn around and go home and come up with some excuse. And I get on the I get on the off ramp, and at the red light, who's ahead of me? She's ahead of me. She she every hair still in place, still a smile on her face, still listening to K Joy, you know in her own little world, having a great day. And I just started to laugh. I thought, oh, my God, look at she, she didn't futz at all. She just stayed within and had a great time, and here she is ahead of me. And I pushed everyone out of my way. And I just I started to laugh. Thank God we laugh. Thank God we laugh. That laughter is deep and heals the soul. I remember the first time I laughed was about a dead dog story somebody was telling from the podium, and I had a few of those. So... You know, I had one in the trunk of my car frozen in January in Iowa for a while, which is another story until my mother found me drunk talking to Tar Baby. You know, it was just not moving in the blanket, you know. Um, so I'm laughing so hard in the back of the room, and everybody's turning around. I realize I'm the only one laughing in the, about this dead dog story. And I can't help it. It got me, you know. I'm just coming from my toes. 
So, uh, you know, that's how sick I am. But that was my first real gut laugh in Alcoholics Anonymous. But we've worked on it. I can I can laugh now at, at things instead of just when you trip or spill coffee on yourself. <laughs> Those used to be my laughs. And I couldn't help myself, you know. We're the kind of people that do that. So I learned something that day. You know, there's an awful lot of ways to go through life. and And I can either... I, you know, skin my knees and, you know, purposefully. It's like life didn't hand me anything I couldn't have just gone, whatever, <laughs> and let it go. I had to make something out of that moment. I had to have my rights. I had to, you know, I had to demand. And, uh, you know, I got to see it that day. I, you know, maybe I'd been doing it for a while. And uh, I, I see it now. One of my biggest meters is driving. You know, I can really see where I'm coming from. And, you know, and I'll even say out loud to myself, boy, you really aren't letting go today. Or, you know, you're not in a very good mood today. Or what's bugging you today? Um, you know, and, uh, and I, you know, I used to wave at people with my one finger, you know, and I don't do that anymore. You know, I just, I wave at them. And whatever I think is my own prerogative, you know, <laughs> yeah, sure, fine, go ahead. You know, and I don't, I don't say it out loud anymore. And. So I've, I've I, you know, becoming um, a citizen, becoming a worker among workers, becoming um, uh, a good member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I mean, this is where it started. It also talks in the family a- afterward about spiritual intoxication and going, like, off the deep end. Um, uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a lopsided way to live. It's... Um, you know, you're so great here and you do everything and you, you give everybody a ride home and give someone your last $5 if they need a, a meal, but then you go home and you kick the dog and you bitch at the people in the home and, you know, great, you know, <laughs> great. Um, and I had lived in kind of that situation for a while and, and I kept thinking it was me. It's got to be me. i got to do some more work. It's, you know, because I kept it all about me, of course. It's not that this person is on a dry drunk because he's in flotation tanks, he's uh, uh, not going to meetings, he's going to punk rock concerts, uh, you know, he's burning incense and listening to the doors and hanging up beaded curtains. Might be a problem here. But, you know, I kept thinking it was me. This was my husband when he had this kind of strange turn. And um, I I threw some eggs one day at him. And, uh, you know, he just looked at me, walked away, and guess who had to clean up the eggs? It's like, I didn't hit him with any of them, and I had to clean up the eggs, and I had this... You know, I, I was angry. I was upset. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not a very violent person, really, unless I'm threatened, really. I'm just not. And uh, I was, uh, you know, he was punching walls, and I was starting to punch things. And I had to go talk to, you know, hurt. I had to go talk to Don Newcomb in our group, who's um, an old violence guy. Um, if you ever need a knife to break into something, he always has a knife. <laughs> you know, I mean, legitimately break into something. So we always look for Don. But... Um, you know, he had to teach me how to keep my hands in my pocket to just start there, just to keep your hands in your pocket, you know. I mean, we didn't have the physical stuff between us in sobriety. I've had a lot of it before, and uh, I'm a defender. I'm definitely a defender, and um, so I'm ready to go. I'm always ready. I always had that middle child attitude, okay, got to prove myself. I'm coming in the room like this. <laughs> And where I work today, it's so healthy. I'm in a healthy law firm. I know that's kind of a, what do you call that? It's, a, it's like a paradox or it's, you know. Yeah, thank you. I just, um, and my boss is so on to me. He's so funny. He's all on to me. And he always, you know, starts every, every conversation when he, we have to close the door. He said, this isn't a criticism. <laughs> this isn't a criticism, you know. And now we kind of laugh about it. I say, okay, I'll put my fist down, you know. And, um uh, it's just, I mean, and this has only been in the last couple of years that I've gotten that healthy at the job place. I mean, I fake it. I know how to fake it. Let, I can fake it in the world. And thank God that I know that my actions are what are important because the head's caught up. The head has caught up. The heart has caught up. I mean, I'm a... I'm a let's have a great time kind of alcoholic, so I'm like a happiness junkie. I'm kind of a joy junkie. I mean, I love to go to these conferences and fly high with all of you eagles, you know. And and then I would come home Sunday night. Was like, oh, I got to go to that meeting and coffee commitment, and I got to get up and go to work tomorrow and put gas in the car and you know all that stuff that everybody most people do every day of their life and they don't whine and complain about it you know but I like living up here 
And it was my second sponsor that told me, Sharon, it's like landing the plane. Oh, put your wheels down and land the plane back on the tarmac. You're not crashing and burning. It's like, you know, everything was so dramatic. Everything all about me and self, self, self. And then it goes into self-pity and isolation, and I can't afford that. I used to have, <laughs> I do better now, but if I had like, a weekend off, you know, husband or, or uh, my boyfriend of many years, if he was like out in a golfing expedition and, and I actually didn't have to go speak somewhere, I think, oh, God, I got all these projects to do and two days off to do them. And, you know, by four o'clock in the afternoon, the first day, I'm like, got the Hagen Dass and the spoon, you know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm looking for some sort of comfort, you know, it's like, God. I just need structure. Structure keeps me emotionally balanced, you know. Having commitments keep me emotionally balanced. Being responsible. I mean, that's one of my favorite quotes is that, you know, we've been given this life, but then you have to, I'm not quoting it right, but then we have to have the, the, the shoulders, you know, we have to have shoulder the responsibility that's been given to us, and that's so, so true. And it, am I going to listen to a crazy person? I'm not. You know, I'm not. I, I seek out the calm in the room. I seek out the fun in the room. I seek out the ones that are doing it in the room. I'm, you know, stark raving sober is one of the phrases you hear people talking about. And, and uh, you know, I'll help you out. I'll drive you where you got to go. But I'm not going to, you know, I just I don't want to sit around that anymore. That's like being all jacked up on two pots of coffee or something. It's just painful. Um, um, so... I, I like to hang around with the people in, in the room that are having a good time, that are committed, that I see a smile on their face, that I see a lightness in their step. Um, that's why one of the reasons Clancy's my sponsor. After 48 years, he still has that lilt in his step. He still walks into an AA meeting happy as a clam. He's still out there doing it. And I've, sp I've had sightings of him, like connecting at an airport. And I've come from somewhere, and we're connecting in Denver, and I see him, and he's on the LA flight. I'll watch him a while. And he's writing those 50 postcards he writes to people. He's sitting there catching up on those postcards he writes to people. Um, you know, he's taking the cart because he's tired. But then he sees somebody he knows, and we're walking, and he's not going to take the cart, you know. And, uh, but, I mean, the, and the man goes to the mission. He's down at the mission doing what he needs to do to try to save lives there. And uh, I admire that. And, yeah, he's a lot of bluster, and he's a lot of brilliance, but he's a lot of doing stuff when you're not looking. He's a lot of heart. He's a lot of, you know, making sure someone's got groceries in the house. He's making sure that people have families, that if they're having a hard time that that rent is paid. He's kind of behind a lot of that stuff that goes on. And, and I think when I went through my divorce, I got a little thing in the mailbox, just put through my slot, and I had no money, none. And I had this little baby boy, and somebody had put some cash in an envelope for Christmas. And they said, this is for the Barker Baby Christmas Fund. And... Um, I know, I know it was behind that. And, you know, I never really knew. But the beautiful thing of that is I get to pass that on, that I shoulder that responsibility of what's been given to me to pass it on. And that's an amazing freedom. Um, so um, I, uh, I've had other points in my life where, you know, my, my demands, um, you know, relationships, that's one of the biggest, biggest, hugest areas is to, to let you be who you are and to not get in the way of your own personal growth your own spiritual growth, whatever you need to do. Because, uh, I, you know, cause I see a better way. <laughs> you know, it's like I'm not involved in it emotionally. That's why we have sponsors because they're, between me and my sponsors, like, you know, a space. There's air. Between me and me, I'm on me. You know, it's working. It's up, ready, sitting on the edge of the bed, ready to tell me when I get up in the morning. It's got great ideas, you know. <laughs> but between me and my sponsor, there's not that emotional craziness there's not that emotional demand on myself there's, you know that's that there's air and in that air there's God working there's God working and um, I um, I had um, that hallway that I was in when I went through my divorce which was so painful and the newcomer in the room and Jill um, Jill was the woman he married and and I was, I was really, I was 10 years sober and having a hard time. And that's when my sponsor smoked pot and I ended up getting Clancy as my sponsor. And I had every right to hate every single one of you because you all knew he was having this affair. You all knew and no one told me. And I was so mad at you. It's like, what's somebody going to tap me in the shoulder and go, your husband's you know, sleeping with that newcomer in the corner over there. Uh, really? I asked him and he said, no, you know, okay. Um, but life at home was really, really hard, really hard. And um, 
and I, I hated all of you, and I came in here, and I wasn't emotionally very sober that year, I'll tell you, but Clancy became my sponsor, and he was louder than my head, which was great. Um, I did things like I cut my hair really short and spiked it up, um, so it was pointed. I mean, it, it was white, too. I, did, I dyed it like white, and um, that Madonna white at the time. And little spikes so that, you know, and I folded my arms and sat in the front row with my legs kicked out so you'd have to walk over them. Because I'm here, I hate all of you, and I'm not leaving. <laughs> thank God for that. I mean, thank God for that attitude. It kept me in the room. You're just going to all have to watch me suffer. <laughs> and this lady walked by. You know, you don't hear it till you hear. I mean, I was, I was doing crazy stuff at 10 years sober so I could get caught so you'd know how much pain I was in. I was shoplifting at the Broadway. I would shoplift belts and things, and I would just put them on me and would come catch me. Somebody catch me, you know, put me in jail. And I had to give that up and make amends at 11 years of sobriety to the Broadway before they went out of business, thank God. They went out of business. <laughs> I would be like, I don't know what I'd do. But um, I didn't put them out. I really didn't take that much. So, um <laughs> But I, that's the attitude I had at meetings. A really, really, and all of my kind of healthy babies had to move on. They had to move on because I am, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty nuts. I got really wacky girls at that time. You know, ones with eyeballs spinning, can't put a sentence together. Loved it. I loved it. They, I just put them in the car and we drive to Sacramento from L.A. to go speak at a meeting. And they go, can we stop and go to the bathroom? I go, no, we're driving. <laughs> we're driving. Hold it. You know, I was crazy. But the beauty of it is, especially the two most wacky ones are still sober today. And I still sponsor them. We laugh about that time. One of them said, I didn't know you were that crazy. The other one said, I did know you were that crazy. <laughs> but, um, but so that's kind of, you know, that was a really rough time. And I didn't have any emotional sobriety. And I was mad. And I was the victim. And I was in self-pity. And I was wearing that old victim cloak I finally had hung up and put in the back of my closet, you know, because I like being the victim. It just works. There's no guilt. In victim, there's no guilt, you know, and I'm an old Catholic girl. If there was guilt, I'd find it, and I got sick of guilt. And if you're the victim, it's your fault. And I was really good at it. And I was putting that old scratchy wool black victim coat again, and I was like, Brr. And this lady, Pat Hodges, who's not with us anymore, um, walked by me, and she said, look at, she had somebody with her. She said, look at Sharon, do you want what she's got? She's got 10 years. And she kind of looked me up and down and walked by. I thought, oh, that wasn't nice. What do you, I don't even know this person, and what you should say to them about me, you know? But I heard her. I heard her. Do you want what she's got? She's got 10 years. Probably not. Um, and then the night that my sponsor caught me, thank God, you know, I was kind of getting, I was getting ready to kind of let it go. I had the keys to my ex-husband's car. I was going to go drive it at low tide on the beach and leave it. I had some plans. See, my, you know, I was not, God was not in there. God had deserted me. I was back into being the victim. There was no, there was no healthy dependence on God. It was all on, you know, all in my sickness. And I didn't know I could get that sick again because I didn't get what I wanted or I got hurt or, you know, life goes on. Poor me. And uh, I was on my way to the corner of the room with two big hot cups of black coffee just because they were laughing and having a good Saturday night, him and her. And I didn't want them to have a good Saturday night. It was the hardest meeting, and they were just having a great time. And I was on my way with two hot cups of black coffee to see how they'd feel once it hit them. And um, <laughs> I wasn't going to give it to them. I was going to throw it at them. And Clancy happened to be at the Saturday night meeting, which he usually is not. He speaks a lot. And uh, the meeting had tables then, and so he kind of saw where I was going and saw what I had in my hand. I think he saw the, that wild dog on the freeway look that was kind of in my eyes and where, where I, my trajectory was to them. And he kind of got me halfway and took the coffee out of my hands and put it down and put his hands on my shoulders. And he just very firmly said, Sharon, you'll walk through this with dignity and grace. And I didn't hear him there, but I heard him when he said, so you can be an example to others. I don't, don't tell me that. Just let me, just stop at the dignity and grace because I want revenge and I don't care about dignity and grace. Look at me. Do I care? I don't care. Uh, but he said, so you can be an example to others. And that's a very powerful statement to me. I take very, very seriously what you've given me. And I don't want to ever be the kind of example that someone looks at me and goes, AA doesn't work. I'm going to go drink and die and break my mother's heart. 
I don't want to be that. I mean, I'm not that powerful. I, know, I do know that, but I don't want to be that example of pushing somebody out the door with my actions. So I left them alone, and what happened was um, they got married and had a baby, and uh, her little baby is 18 years old. Yesterday I missed his little birthday party. Um, and, um, and my son went, and I was invited, and, uh, uh, you know, we don't know where he is. They've been divorced, gosh, I don't know how many years. But the way I kind of worked my way out of that, that thing with her was um, she played softball. And I played on the opposite team so that so I could catch every single one of her balls. So she was a lefty and I was first base. And not one of her balls ever got by me. And I got hit with, you know, I would throw my body in the ground in front of her ball. You know? <laughs> You know, if it went around me, it was just it was just spinning. I could still pick it up, and um, so everybody always looked at me every time Jill was up. You know, there goes Gumby. You know, <laughs> motivated. And um, but we had um, we had we had to do family time with the kids. My sponsor said you will show up and you will not say anything about how nice she is when your son gets back in the car after their weekend together and how nice he, that she was to him and what he bought her. You will shut up. You will bite your tongue. You will not say it. And I learned to keep my mouth shut, which was huge for me. Huge for me. You know, I'm a tequila drinker. I open my mouth when I want. You know, and a lot of times people didn't like what I said, and I paid the price. But um, I'm a middle child. That's my character. That's my personality. I'm going to prove myself. I'm not going to, you know, wait to get uh, ignored. Uh uh. Um, and so, you know, part of that, that, that part of me that is a fighter, um, uh, that part of me that, that had that Mensa sister, I got to call her up and go, thank you, Nancy, for helping me co- be competitive. You know, it helped me be competitive, that Mensa sister I had to follow through school two years later. You know, it helped me learn to be competitive, and that helps in the work world. You know, not competitive to the point where I'm stepping on bodies. I don't really care about that, but just... I work with a lot of men, and there are a lot of smart men, and I have to sit in the conference room with me and a lot of men. And, you know, sometimes, you know, after the first five words out of a woman's mouth, it's kind of like, eh, next, you know. So I've learned how to be competitive and say my piece and and be um, clear. And the rest of the time, I shut my mouth, and I literally have learned a clue. I, I, I pinch this part of my hand. So I don't say what I think I want to say, (laughs) which is we've heard from you before. Will you please shut up and move on, you know? Are we still on this topic? You know, things like that. Let's get into the solution. We've discussed this to death. That stuff doesn't work in the world of business where I am anyway. Um, So I literally, I pinch my hand under the table so I don't say it. And that's emotional. That's some sort of emotional sobriety for me. Um, In the work world, they don't care. They want their, they want, good morning, how are you? And they don't want to hear, really. They don't want to hear. They want to hear, fine, thank you, how are you? They want to talk about themselves. AA has taught me to remember their name, shake in their hand, and let them talk about themselves. And if you walk away from somebody at a business meeting and you thank them by name, they think you're great. God, you remember my name. They think you're great. That's it. Everything else is just filler. And you taught me that here. You know, even if I have to go into a situation where I'm really kind of nervous about, you've taught me how to fit into the room and be one of many, one of many. Um, You know, when I sit at my Wednesday night meeting, I'm one of many. That keeps me emotionally in check. There are, you know, I'm 31 and a half years sober in 21 days, but who's counting? And then, um, (laughs) but there are people in the room, I bet I can count 20 people with more sobriety than me. And that's such a safe place to sit. That's one of another reason why I go there, is I can just... Settle on in and look at all the people still ahead of me doing it and having a good time. Um, I, um, you know, practicing the principles is, you know, in all my affairs, I'm really, I really work on that all the time. I really, it's the beautiful thing is I see, I can see where I'm, I can feel it now. I've had that awakening as a result of these steps. I can feel it here. <laughs> Oh, that's a lie. Oh, that's not the truth. Oh, you you stretched the imagination. Oh, you better not say that. Oh, you better be kind. And I have one girl in my department that doesn't like me. And I inherited this department when the other person left. Even my boss says, she just doesn't like you. I don't know what it is. It's like, good, validation. You know, I think it's me again. Well, it is me in this case, and it's validation. So I've learned how to... um, 
I, I have these beads I have to wear if I deal with her and so I can play with the beads instead of, you know. And she's not nice. She's not nice. And I, you know, in California we have a lot of laws. You can't say things. You have to behave. And uh, I've had to learn how to keep it on point and behave. And I walk away sometimes and it's like, oh, my God. And I have to just bless her, bless her, bless her. She, you know, I, I go to, I, I'm so loyal that I went to this job for, I don't know, five years too long at the last law firm where it just wasn't working. And I kept going, okay, they're going to teach me how not to be. They're going to teach me how not to be today. I mean, that was my new mantra, walking into work. And, and one day I walked in and somebody slammed me with something. The minute I walked in, I mean, I'll go away on a weekend. They would pile work up on me till I have to stay until 11 o'clock at night because they knew I was going away for a weekend. It was just, and then I come back on Monday and the work would be piled up. Nobody would have done anything. I was just like, ugh. It was hard because I'd been there, you know, 10, 11 years before it started to change. And uh, one day I walked in and I went, you know what? I know how not to be. I don't have to be here anymore. But I'm real hard-headed. It takes me a while to see things. And, you know, a lot of people have been telling me for a couple of years, I'll help you put your resume together. I'll help you put your resume together. And, um, but I, I don't let go till I let go. I just... I learned to, learned to loosen my grip, you know, finger by finger. Oh, yeah, that was painful. We loosened the grip a little bit, you know. I loosened my grip. It's rare that I go and I go, just take it, God, and come into my heart and life and help me change this. I'll be transformed from this moment on. I, I have to hit my head. I have to be embarrassed. I have to eat a crow sandwich. I have to say, I'm sorry, how can I make it right? I have to I have to do that. I had to do that a year ago. We, we had... Um, we were getting, we were eloping. It was quiet and secret. My husband and his brother and his high school girlfriend who got together after years of his brother being divorced in Chicago called and they decided, the brothers decided to elope and get married. And I was proposed to and it was, you know, so I'm calling people, inviting them. I'm not asking anyone. I'm like, oh my God, it's a small little place and a small little wedding. And I'm like, you know, and I and I know, you know, my friends say, Sharon, you're just a big hearted person. Yeah, it's just that I'm a big hearted person. You know, it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't like I'm being um, not very thoughtful with the other three people involved here. We only have so many seats in this tiny chapel, and I'm gonna fill them with my friends. You know, um, on this secret, private little eloping. You know, oh, I had to I had to call one person back and pay for the airline ticket, and I was just oh, I mean, she still loves me to this day, but it was it was painful. <laughs> and I wasn't thinking of everybody else. You know, I got all caught up in that. Let's fly up here, you know. You know, it's like, I got my seat. You know, who cares about you? Um, this is my future husband, you know. It's like, oh, God, that was that was a tough sandwich to eat. And I hope I don't ever stay so non-flexible that I can't eat a crow sandwich if I have to. Um, but um, one of the biggest moments I remember, and this was almost an awakening um, or an, an experience for me, um, was with uh, my family because being the only alcoholic, being the one that's a little bit more intense, being the one who always brought the party, the friends that I have now in my mother's house, is, they, I mean, they're much more acceptable and fun and she loves them. Uh, they're givers. <laughs> used to be the takers, you know, things would be missing from the house or they convinced me to take my father's car and never have to see it again. Um, those kind of people were the kind of people I used to bring home to party with. But now my parents liked, you know, they liked, my dad got to see AA a lot of years in our home when I would go home to Iowa. I'm so glad. I'm so glad because um, he looked at me one day and he said, Sharon, you got it made here. <laughs> If you think about doing what you're doing before, think twice, as we locked eyes that day. It was really a great day. It was really a great day. So, you know, I had to go home and be a good daughter and act right no matter what. And it was my sister's wedding weekend. And um, I came on the plane, and I came alone, and I was, I think I was about five years sober. And I had done the amends with my dad, and I had, now I'm just, I was just starting making the financial. I had done the amends with my family and my mother and other people I needed to in, in Iowa. So I was pretty, felt pretty good about going back there now. Um, I was about like five or six years sober. And they picked me up at the airport, and everybody was in the van. You know, this is Cedar Rapids, Iowa. This has got a Hawkeye, Cedar Rapids guy. He knows all the check places, everything. I love it. it makes me feel at home. Yakshabash. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Dubcha, yeah. <laughs> and I know how to swear, and that's about a bit. You know, Grandpa Wesley taught me that, too, um, in Czech. 
But um, they pick me up, and, and I'm, I'm in the van, and we turn off on this country road that, because we live way out in the country, and um, the house I grew up in, I mean, it's just, I could always go home. It was so great. I'm so glad that I became an Iowa girl. I really did become an Iowa girl. Um, again, I healed that up. Um, but all of a sudden, I'm realizing Nancy Mensa's sister in the front seat, she, of course she gets the front seat. She's talking to my dad. They're talking about finance, you know, money. She was brilliant with that. My, uh, my brother's in the back talking to the new, you know, son-in-law. They're talking about they're from Alaska. He's from Alaska fishing or something. Um, my mother's talking to my other sister, the one getting married, whose weekend it's about, about, you know, the dresses or the gifts or something. And I'm sitting in the middle section of the van in the middle and I'm hearing all this going on and I think nobody's even asking me how, my, how, I, how I am. Nobody wants to know about how is AA out in Southern California. I mean, it's like, are you sponsoring people? Are you working with them? You know, <laughs> they just live their lives like that. And all of a sudden, before I realize it, I'm having a cathartic sobbing experience. You know, where you can't stop it. And, and it's coming from my toes. And I am like leaned over sobbing. I've had a couple of those once in an AA meeting, and the guy thought I was laughing, which he was happy. I was laughing at his talk, but I was, something happened. It was weird. But um, your shoulders are shaking, and I'm, and I'm realizing, oh, my God, I, you know. And my dad stops the van, turns around, and looks at me, and he said, are you okay? Are you okay? And I thought, it's my moment. I've been waiting my whole life to tell him why I am the way I am. I could start with you, Mensa sister, you know, and I could go right around this room, and maybe the new son-in-law would have something to tell him by the time I'm in the back, you know? So it's my moment. The van is stopped. They're all looking at me, and it's, I've been waiting for this my whole life. I've got the list. I'm sure I can pull it out in a second. And instead, because I was already practiced in the principle of, of prayer and meditation, instead of that, I just said, oh, I just need some air, you know, so they opened the van, I got out, and I stood, because God said, shut up, Sharon, just shut up, I mean, I heard that voice louder than my head, that intuitive tug, just shut up, so I got out, and they're just back to their conversation, she just needs some air, you know, they took me at face value, um, they didn't know, I've been, this is, you know, I've been waiting 30 years for this, here I am, and I'm going to tell each one of you why I drank, why my life is this way, and why it's your fault, and, um, <coughs> I stood there for a while, contained myself, and I started to look at this amazing cornfield ahead of me, which, um, you know, I grew up looking at cornfields. And, um, and I was so from Wisconsin, if I was out in the world, because I had that Midwest accent, and they had cheese um, and, you know, dairy cows. They didn't have pigs and corn, so I was at least from Wisconsin. It was more elegant or something. <laughs> so here I am in Iowa looking at that corny corn, and I am starting to calm down a little bit. And I was drawn into the corn. It was an amazing thing. It was, um, for a moment there, it's all green and pretty, and uh, the top of it just seems to have a lot of life. There's always a lot of life around the top of a cornfield. There's little things buzzing. There's a lot of light. It just sucks up the sun. And, pulls in the heat, um, grows fast, and you can watch it grow literally in the summer. And I, um, I kind of turned away for a second, and, I, and, and out of the corner of my eye, I saw that it was all laid out in rows. And I, got from, I said, God's got a plan. God's got a plan for me. It's going to be okay. I got to just see that, you know, because you have to work the soil, and you have to plant it just right, and you have to have the right equipment, and you have to have the right seed, and sometimes you don't plant anything on it for a couple of years, and sometimes you rotate crop, and just for a second, I got that the whole thing was planned out, and God had a plan for me, and then I looked back at it, and it was just all kind of green again, and um, I felt some really great forgiveness, some really great forgiveness um, for me and everybody in the car, and I didn't have to tell them, and I've never had to tell them which is a beauty because I would have destroyed everything that we had worked hard to get to, that Alcoholics Anonymous had brought into their life. So I think I want to kind of end on one of these um, 
So I've learned to grow up spiritually and emotionally. I've learned how to shut my mouth. I've learned how to pick up the phone and laugh with you because by the time I tell you how serious this is, I almost got drunk over the color of a car. <laughs> I was in my first year. I got the car. It was uh, an old primer gray Malibu. And you had to put, my sponsor put a chair behind because uh, the seat was broken and I would low ride up to meetings, you know, and she didn't like that. So she got an old chair that was broken from the meeting and put it behind my broken seat so I could sit up and drive. And, and I, I was waitressing tables and I got Hank Johnson, God bless him, in the big meeting in the sky, sold me my car insurance. And uh, to this day, every time I call him and renew my insurance, now they're thanking me for my 32 years of service. You know, I think right on, Hank. I mean, he came to my house, and he sat there, and he wrote out my insurance policy on his knees because I didn't have a table. I had a $24 a week room when I my first apartment in AA, and I had a coffee pot, and I made him some Mr. Coffee, and we wrote out that insurance policy, and, and um, you know, I gave him some money, and I felt like a citizen that day. And, I, you know, it's like that. He helped me grow up. Elisa, you need an insurance policy. I'll come over and see you. And so he knocked on my little silly door in Inglewood and came in and sat down, and I gave him some waitress tips that I had been saving for my first payment, and um, so I was all all in this, you know, I was all legal there in that car. And I called my sponsor and I said, I just picked up my car at, at uh, Earl Scheib, and it's uh, it's turquoise. And I didn't pick turquoise. I picked Basin Street Blue. It was like a New Orleans color. It was wrong. Shouldn't have done that. And so when I picked up my car, I said, I, this isn't my car. And they said, that's the color you picked. I said, it's not the color I picked. Come look. You know, it's the books in the bookcase. I said, this is the color I picked. I showed them on the wall. And they said, well, it's faded. It's faded. <laughs> Drive your turquoise car out of here. You know, it was 1976 or, seven, yeah, 76. Nobody was into turquoise cars then, I'll tell you. And <laughs> especially a Malibu. It was like, oh, my God, it was so bright you couldn't even look at it. You could pick it out of a huge parking lot shining over there. Um, <laughs> So I, I, I called my sponsor because I was thinking, I'm going to have a drink. I can't stand this. I can't. You know, I'm looking at it. Here's Hobo Joe's restaurant. Here's Hobo Joe's bar, and there are pay phones in between. And I thought I better call that sponsor and tell her, I need a drink. I need a drink bad. And she had me laughing. You know, what did they tell you to do? Not wax it and not wash it for two weeks. Come bring it over after you get off work. We'll wax it and wash it. We'll tone it down. You know, so she had me laughing. And um, thank God. Thank God I have sponsors louder than my head so that I learned how to, um, I learned how to tune into that. I learned how to listen. I learned how to listen. It's a big art, learning how to listen. Learning how to be here, be now, and listen. What you need, what you want, what, you, what I can do for you. Um, listening is, is, is rough. I don't think a lot of us take the time to listen. And um, it's very quiet and joyful to listen. Um, that's what I like to do. When my cat was dying, I had to counter heartbeats. That was what the vet had me do, was counter heartbeats every day. And, uh, yeah, yes, sir. Um, 18 years, buddy, you know, it's a long time. But that was our morning meditation, and the last couple months was the counter heartbeats. And so it was a really beautiful listening thing. Um, and then, of course, I have to count again because I don't trust myself, you know. It's just <laughs> alcoholic mind, never sleeps. But, um, you know, I just uh, I think about... I think about how my dad, how this beautiful, uh, being an example, worked with my father and um, paying back the money and, you know, getting to that point of emotionally being able to sit in a room with him and have, have a day together, uh, picking out things at Menard's hardware store in Cedar Rapids and, you know, going and helping him weed his garden and, and uh, just to be there for him and have that kind of peace and joy around my father um, was amazing. And being that example, not opening my mouth that day, not... Not, you know, not being in a hurry when they called me on the phone or when I talked to them, making the time to, to actually be their daughter and, and, and be there for them. And my dad that had 12-stepped, uh, you know, because he bought the big book and read it, I told you last night, at 12-stepped this guy. Um, that was the town drunk. He came to complain about his wife, Mary. And um, my dad said, John, you're an alcoholic. Go to AA. It's not her fault. It'll, you know, it'll help you. it help my daughter. And I don't know if he gave him the book then or not. I don't know. But, but John is still sober. <laughs> you know, John is still sober. And the beauty of that story is I got to see where the, the healthy uh, ripple is from the stone I threw in my father's life. I got to see the ripple hit the shore one day because um, a girl came up to me and told me um, at a meeting, my dad was dead a couple years, and she said, 
Um, and I mentioned that little story, I um, hadn't mentioned it before, about my dad 12-stepping a town drunk. And she came up to me and she said, um, what's that man's name? I told her and she said, that's my uncle, he's still sober. And she said, I went home to a family reunion. This is in California. She said, I went home to a family reunion two years ago in Iowa, and that uncle your dad told to go to AA, he 12-stepped me, I have two years. And so you never, ever, ever know. You never know. You know, that you just want, you're supposed to keep your commitments and show up, and maybe that one night you say something to somebody where you're saving a life. Um, you know, uh, just with, with whatever God put you in front of them for. You know, God works through people. God, God works through love. Um, God works through my heart. God works through my actions. So when my head won't shut up, my mouth can. You know, please, God, keep one hand firmly on, uh, on my shoulder and the other hand firmly over my mouth. <laughs> you know, so a lot is what I say a lot of days. So that and, and that and the St. Francis prayer. So I'm just going to read the St. Francis prayer and then um, we'll take a little break. I did good? Enough time? Okay, good. I put my glasses on upside down. So <laughs> I still need a keeper. <laughs> All right. Lord, make me a channel of thy peace, that where there is hatred I may bring love, that where there is wrong I, be, I may bring the spirit of forgiveness that where there is discord, I may bring harmony, that where there is error, I may bring truth, that where there is doubt, I may bring faith, that where there is despair, I may bring hope, that where there are shadows, I may bring light, that where there is sadness, I may bring joy. Lord, grant that I may seek rather to comfort than to be comforted, to understand than to be understood, to love than to be loved. For it is by self-forgetting that one finds. It is by forgiving that one is forgiven. It is by dying that one awakens to eternal life. Amen. So we'll take a break. Okay, it's now time to observe the seventh tradition, which states that every AA group ought to be fully self-supporting, declining outside contributions. And as soon as we're done passing the baskets, uh, we'll open it up for question and answers. And again, uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand, make the question brief. And it is uh, it's an opportunity to ask a question, not an opportunity to share. All right, with that, Sharon. Oh, thanks, Chris. Um, Sharon Alcoholic? Hi, Sharon. Hi, Sharon. Okay, so I didn't think I have anything to say on that topic. I talked a long time, so... Just wind me up, pick, get me up in the middle of the night. I can give a talk, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I try to be quiet in the morning. That's my good time. So um, I had to get up real early to have quiet time this morning. All right. Who wants to open it up? A question? Um, okay. I'm Curtis. I'm Hi, Curtis. Hi, Curtis. Hi, Curtis. We're going to talk about a little bit about the defects, huh? Um, yeah, well, I think I have to get to the point of being humbled before I can see what's going on. Um, so, you know, when I, I, I did have, um, actually, I haven't had that many experiences, but I did have one with jealousy that was huge for me. Um, and um, I really wanted it removed, and it didn't go away. And I thought, well, and it must be, as the prayer says, useful. <laughs> So it's like, oh, I hate that one. You know, it's got that little, um, you know, that little uh, uh, part in it that says that, you know, if it's useful, it stays around. And so it stayed around. And so I thought, well, I don't know who it's being useful to, but um, God did not remove it. So um, I, uh, my husband now, he was being kind of um, stalked by somebody at one point, And you know, I always think it's my imagination or me, and uh, actually he was. <laughs> and we were at this uh, event, which was our group event, and it was uh, like a big golf thing they have once a year. And um, it's at a mellow place, and it's a spa, and so the, you know, the non-golfers can go to the spa and mellow out. And so 
she was there, and um, so in the afternoon Saturday, when it was kind of quiet time before dinner, she knocked at the door. I opened the door, and she was there at the hotel door and wanting to speak to my uh, husband-to-be. And so I was like, I let her in, and I didn't, you know, make a face. I, I let her in, and I called Casey over, and he, you know, she was asking him, I went in the other room. I didn't want to hear too much. You know, how, how do you get a sponsor? Who you are? Blah, 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 blah. You know, what step are you working? Um, you know, that kind of stuff. So <laughs> I kind of went in the other uh, little area and I was really was trying not to listen. But when it was all over and she left, um, I came out and I kind of got um, the, my evil twin came out. Um, <laughs> Because I told you what I'm like. I'm like this loyal Leo that I have to learn how to, you know, loosely hold people in my life instead of grab on because I'm loyal to you. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of, you know, it was really an interesting moment because after I did all that and frothed at the mouth, there was silence. And there's nothing worse than silence after that kind of an outbreak. You know, no one's getting mad at you. You're not, it's just silence. And as he kind of walked away from me, he turned and he looked, he said, sure, when you act like that with me, you really belittle yourself. Oh. <laughs> yeah, really got me. And I just thought, oh, man, I can't, this is, I am giving way too much power to all of this. And now I'm looking like, Belittle. I let me go. You know, I don't like the way it feels. Let me go look that up. You know, <laughs> I knew it wasn't good. And um, so we took a drive. I said, you know, can we just go take a drive? And so we took a drive, and it happened to be that day a full solar eclipse. So it wasn't a big day to have a spiritual awakening or anything. It was, and right where we were down by San Diego, we went up on a hill and, um, you know, looked through the thing that we can look through because you can't look at the sun. It's like when your kids don't look at the sun. Uh, you know, it's just don't tell alcoholics not to, don't jump out of the car, you know. Uh, I'm at the edge of a cliff, my head's saying jump, jump, you know, just all of that stuff with alcoholics. So at the top of the hill that we stopped and we're, it's a full solar eclipse and I was, I was just, I was like, I just felt like everything that, you know, I, I felt so like I had just dug my grave here. And I just felt so sad for me and God. And it wasn't even a self-pity thing. I just felt really sad that that came into our relationship together and, and that I brought the crap in. And um, so right there, I said the seven-step prayer at the top of the hill. And um, you know what? It, it was removed. I, I mean, I can't say it's not going to come back and rear its ugly head as it talks about. But that's one of my experiences where it was removed. So um, that's the, I think we get one maybe in our lifetime. We get one. We get one pulled out of us, and the rest is useful and progress, not perfection. So I hope I helped. I saw, yeah. Um, yes, Carl. Carl. Well, yeah, yeah, the principles. Um, I don't know where they're written down, and probably somebody that's more of a book person, but it's, you know, I had gotten a 12 and 12 from an old timer, and at the top of each uh, step, she wrote, like, awareness, uh, acceptance, perseverance, um, charity. Um, you know, there, there are 12 principles that, do you know, Paul, where they came from? I don't know where they came from, um, but it's, you know, handed about in, in AA since I've been here, there are, you know, they have different names sometimes. Instead of charity, they'll say love, but um, but I don't know where the principles are there. Uh, do you know where they came from? Well, most of the old timer tapes I have uh, got names that are parsable. 
Okay, so yeah, just... Yeah, called the stash. <laughs> right, I mean, right. <laughs> we had a spiritual awakening as a result, result of these steps, right. <laughs> right. Yeah, I mean, that's that basic, really. But, you know, they, they, you know, I think out of the four absolutes came different things, and they, sure. old-timers kind of named something with each step, you know, so. Yeah, because I would look at them, and I, you know, I'd break down the steps and go, is there a principle here? Of course there is, you know, like yeah. Step one and step two, and I just wondered if, is there a step that there is a list? There is a list, and they, you know, they put it on bookmarks, and they put it, you know, on other things, and. <laughs> And there's workshops done on the principles and, you know, on each step. I mean, you know, it's surrender. <laughs> Hello. Um, I mean, it's not, it's, it's uh, you know, it's not rocket science, really. But um, when I go out in the world, am I going to, you know, act like a decent human being or am I going to not act like a decent human being, you know? And what does that entail at the moment, you know? I mean, it's easy to do the easy stuff. It's a little harder to go see someone at midnight. It's a little harder to invite someone to sleep on your couch. It's a little harder to have someone vomit in the backseat of your car. It's a little harder to rally around somebody who, you know, you have to figure out what to do because she's going home to a situation where she's going to get another black eye, you know. So, I mean, it's easy to do the easy stuff. Um, I, th I think, to me, just walking into life and into the world and trying to be aware, just trying to, to, to hear what, what I need to do and to see what I need to do, you know. But yeah, I don't know. I asked somebody that question a few years ago. Where did these principles come from? And, you know, they were, you know, where did, you know, sponsorship come from? You know, that, that's a story about some guy in uh, Schneider, right? Clarence Schneider? You know, and that's a fun old story. So, you know, if you find out, will you let me know, you know? But um, as, you know, as Paul says, it's pretty simple. It's just the steps. I mean, what does it mean to you? What does step three mean to you? What does step four mean to you? Getting honest, you know, fearless, hard. You know, we lived our whole life based on fear. Now it's it's some sort of uh, basic um, spiritual principles that that can translate into any language, which is love. You know, love and giving. You know, we can do no. I love that that uh, Mother Teresa said we can do no great things, only small things with great love. And I try to remember that. You know, it's great love to feed my cats in the morning. It's great love to walk my dog. It's great love to kiss my son goodbye even though he's sleeping. You know, he's 22. It's great love to, to, to you know, have food ready when my husband comes home. that He can just warm up, you know. It's great love to, to you know, have somebody at work that looks like they're having a bad day. Go take them for a cup of coffee, you know. It's, it's great love to call someone because you're thinking about them. Just say hi and not make it about you. It's just, you know, small little things with great love really fill my day, every single day. So. I thought you had your hand up, Deborah. Itching. You're itching your head? <laughs> <laughs> you know what that happens in school. <laughs> <laughs> Sally. Hi, my name's Sally. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, Sally. Can you talk some more about your honesty and your feelings? You kind of touched on that, how to be honest in your feelings without... Uh, for me, putting my left foot in my mouth. Mm. Honest with your feelings without putting your foot in your mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if it, um, if I think I shouldn't say it, I usually shouldn't say it. You know, that's... If I think it, that's... Oh, yeah, well, see, that's the beauty of not being, you know, identifying with my mind anymore. I don't identify with my mind anymore. I identify um, with the person I, I identify with what I do. I, and, and by identify with what I do... The beauty of that is eventually I get all these new habits formed in my mind. And so, um, you know, I can tell when I'm feeding that gremlin after midnight, you know. <laughs> I can tell when I'm taking it out to play with it that it's going to multiply, <laughs> you know. Um, and a lot of the time it's just, uh, you know, I just, the first year of my sobriety, the first couple years of my sobriety being a waitress, my sponsor literally had me open the trunk of my car and put my mind in the trunk of my car and then go punch in work because I was so uh, arrogant at work. I didn't know it was arrogance. You know, I'm a bartender. I'm not going to wait food, you know. What do you want, you know? <laughs> I'm having a bad day. Who cares, you know? You want some eggs scrambled? Okay, good, you know. I was not nice, and I didn't make good money. 
and so my sponsor said to put my mind in the trunk of my car and just be polite and don't say very much and smile a lot. And my life got better as a waitress, a lot better. So I literally had to take my mind out of the trunk. She had me go around and open my trunk, and then I could call her on my, you know. I got home. How was your day? It was great, you know. Would you take your mind out? Yep. You put your mind back? Yep. Okay. What's your mind saying? You know, we kind of laughed about it. But the security guard didn't know what I was doing that whole time I worked there. <laughs> Just kind of looked at me like, okay, yeah, that's her again, you know. It was at a big hotel, and I always went in the security entrance, and he'd always just kind of look at me like, oh, yeah, good morning. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we come in here, we can talk about things that, that we can spill our guts here. I mean, we can we laugh about things and talk about things that out in the normal world um, try it sometime over um, the fruit at a nice market when you have to all pick out the right, you have to pick out peaches. That's a good one. Or apples. That are, you know, people take their time picking them out. Somebody says, how are you? Why don't you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to see you the next time they're in the market. They're going to move away very quickly. She looks okay, but don't talk to her. Yeah. So um, I really, um, I've learned how to be appropriate. I've learned, I mean, I was raised with manners, so it wasn't so hard to go back having manners. But um, it's that selfish and self-centeredness, and I've got to get it, and it's got to come out. No, it doesn't. You know, you need to call someone and talk to them. I mean, if I'm current with my sponsor, um, I'm okay. You know, and uh, I can shut it off at night by putting earplugs in my ears. Then my head gets quiet. It's interesting. That's how I can sleep. I have to always put earplugs in. It makes it shut up. But, um, yeah, I am not, I, am, I don't identify with my mind anymore. That is not who I am. I laugh about it, but it is not who I am anymore. Because that's very alcoholism centers in the mind, and it never sleeps. Cunning, baffling, powerful, and patient. So, yeah, I don't play with it. I don't play with it. I, you know, I don't go take that bad action, not tell anyone, and then, okay, I've moved the line in the sand. I can take another bad action. Okay, look, nothing happened to me yet. Okay, good, I can take another bad action. You know, and then pretty soon I'm $50,000 in debt. You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm divorced. I have no money, and I'm plopping down the credit cards like, like they're fun. It took me 10 years to pay that off. What do you do today when the evil twin wants to <laughs> I mean, if you're caught in the spot, like with a fellow employee or, uh, I guess, somebody that you're in Uh, daily contact with where uh, all of a sudden the evil child wants to come out and say... (laughs) Yeah, I've done things things like saying, let's start this conversation over. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to to say that. Or, you know, I'm going to go and I'll be back in five minutes. I mean, can we talk about this after lunch? Um, I, you know, I didn't mean to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say that. You know, oh, that came out wrong. I, let's, let's start again. I mean, with you guys, I can go, oh, that was, that was not right. That was not accurate. And you go, okay, fine. But in workplace, sometimes it's um, the less said, the better. But, you know, it's like body contact. You know, I am, I'm at my computer like this. It's bad feng shui in our office. And, and, and I've had, you know, people come talk to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very rude. You know, turn around and give them my attention. I mean, first of all, it's the body contact in, in the workplace. It's standing there still. It's not fidgeting. Even if I'm, I'm trying to listen to what you're saying, you know, if I have to write down what I have to do, I'll write it down, you know, instead of getting back to my office. You know, what would you say again? Emailing you. What would you say again? You know, it's like, what am I supposed to do? It's like, pay attention. They want you to work. They don't care. You know, leave it in the trunk of your car, you know, and if she follows you in, Cut it off and take her back. You know, hide her in the bottom drawer. You know, serenity prayer, awareness. I used to say the serenity prayer all the time, and it was short form. It was f it. <laughs> That's the way I could let go. Okay. Have, yep. Hey, Al. Hi, Al. Hi, Al. So you're talking about carry the message part of the 12 step? We talked about those principles that we got to go find <laughs> before. Okay, um, you just want to know about 
how do you take your 12 step work to the next level with somebody? Oh yeah, that, well that, that whole chapter in the big book really breaks it down really beautifully. You know, totally breaks it down beautifully um, with, you know, where we need to go and how we don't preach and how we, you know, we don't judge and how we share from our heart. And I'm so glad that the, all of that's in there because, um, you know, and the thing with, with new people is you've got to go to some more meetings with them, you know. I mean, if you're down to three a week because that works for your schedule and you tell them they got, you got to go to a couple extra, that's when it gets, you know, oh, yeah, I don't have my Tuesday night at home alone or all my calls come in on Thursday or you got to, you know, that's where you got to show up with them. you got to, you got to show them where it is, you know. You can't just tell them, you know. I was told a lot of things. I had no respect for that growing up. You know, people that want to tell me how to do, how I should live my life and this potential and how I should not do this so I can get to that. And, you know, I didn't have any identification with them. But when I got to you and you guys were, you, you were showing me, you weren't telling me. Um, that's that's kind of kicking it up to the next level for me is when, that's when it gets a little bit, you know, harder to do. Kind of cuts into your time. You know, but um, when you see that person six months later and they walk into the room and their lights are on, it's like, wow, I had nothing to do with that but take them to a meeting for the first couple of weeks and then they, you know, show them where the light switch is on me and that's in there on you somewhere and, you know, they find it themselves. It's nothing more awesome to see God work like that. I love sitting next to people poo-poo the word miracle, but I'm sorry. You know, I mean, it's not in a big way, but we are little miracles, really, and I honor and respect that because... Uh, God has entered into our lives in, in ways that are indeed miraculous, it says. That's my favorite little phrases. So, you know, talk is cheap. <laughs> Show them. Show them. The two names. Amy Beth. Amy Beth. <laughs> Hi, Amy Beth. <coughs> For some reason, I was thinking resentments and then fear pops in, but how do you deal with um, you personally? What kind of steps do you take? When you know that either resentment or fear, I mean, obviously we're feeling it, so it's valid, but that it's something you want to move through, what kind of steps do you take to get through that? So if you've got a, a new one coming up? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know. I don't have one right now. Oh, okay. It's, Let's it's tell the room shop. that you're I'm fine. Really okay. <laughs> <laughs> you're cute. <laughs> Well, I mean, it's that's if I can't let go of it right away and it's keeping me up at night, you know, I'm like I'm I I'm still a little bit of a pit bull with what I hang on to sometimes, and I have to tell on myself. That's where it has to start. You know, I have a handful of people that know where I am every time. I have my sponsor and I have four other women, and though so I have those five people that know what's going on in my life at any given time, and so I can call, I can get, I can reach one of them. And I tell on myself. And then, you know, do I need to do some writing on it? You know, we'll discuss that. It, does it, you know, it's, do I need to make an amends? Is this all about me again? Is this, is this a pattern? Is this another one of those? God, those patterns. It's like you think you're, you know, you think you're, you've clipped them off of your shoulders and they just come back on you. And it's like, oh. You, but the beauty and the fun part is, is that to watch, to observe myself and go, I can't believe you're just totally acting like this right now. You know, I really step away and look at it. And then I have some choice to pull it in and stop it. You know, I mean, I do. I stop conversations midstream sometime. With, I'm sorry that's not the whole truth. or this, It's not like this. And I love my husband. In some ways, we're so different. He is such a good, like, specific communicator. Because I go home and I'm, you know, and I'm on different, all 18 different levels. And he'll just go, okay, now, um, which Linda? You know, I mean, you know, <laughs> we know eight Lindas here. Let's use last names and start there. Okay, you know, um, so, I, I mean, I have to respect um, how he thinks, too, to have some sort of a conversation with him. He's helped me a lot. Just, uh, oh, what is it, a spider? Don't, don't, My son's don't, a, don't, don't, no, don't kill it. No, no, no. okay, okay, go. <laughs> Thank you for saving a spider. My uh, my son makes me take them out of the house. He's Spider Boy, so I, I let her. I pick them up. Okay, all right. Well, thank you for saving my life, Barb. <laughs> I had no fear. Did you see that? I had no fear. No fear. That was good. <laughs> That's. I didn't see a thing. What was there, Barb? 
Oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway, there's a handful of people that know at all times so that I can call them. I can stop my behavior. You know, it really, it's, we're so close to each other. And, and I mean, it's, we're only phone calls. I mean, this is cell phone. This is text messaging. This is, you know, need to see you right now, meet you at Starbucks or whatever. I mean, we can, there is no excuse for isolating. There is no excuse for hanging on to it. You know, unless you want to feel bad. And then, you know what? Breaks my heart. And people have done that with me, too, to watch people want to feel bad. I have to let them feel bad until they're done. And they go, okay, I know you worked through this. Can you help me with this? My second sponsor said that I'm like the girl in this meeting, this girl, crazy girl in our meeting. She's not here. She's not alive anymore. She was sober, but crazy. She had a tracheotomy. She used to clean it out with a pencil in the bathroom and blow on the mirror. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's like, they go shake her hand. All right. Yeah. But she stayed sober, but she was pissed off. That's where her voice was. I don't know. That's a, you know, opinion. But she said, you, you remember Sandra? And I went, yeah, I remember her. She said, do you remember how she used to, like, walk around? I said, no. I said, okay, that was before your time. She would walk around. She had this thing, and she'd look at it, put it in her pocket. She'd take it out and look at it put it in her pocket, you know, and then blow on her thing. And, and she said, one day she trusted me to, to see what was in there, to look in there and let. And I looked in her hand. She had like an old dried up turd, like a cat turd or something, like an old dried up turd. And I thought, she reminds you, I remind you of her. It's like, she said, yeah, yeah, you do remind me of her, that you hang on to these things that don't mean anything. They're old turds. And I remember looking looking at her with every bit of sincerity, and I said, I know, but it belongs to me. <laughs> my turd. <laughs> Get your own. You know, so that's how I loosen my grip on things. Usually with a, you know, a slam dunk from a sponsor or a slam dunk with a faux pas or when I just, you know. That's the way I grow. I don't grow so, I mean, I don't have to beat, you know, you can beat yourself up. You can be, you know, you can wake up one morning and go, oh, I think I'll work on my resentments and jealousy this morning. I mean, who wakes up like that? I don't. I have to have it shown to me, you know, usually. But I don't have to be so beaten up anymore. I don't get off on that anymore. There's, there's, there's too many solutions and too many people that have walked through it. That's the beauty of a home group. That's the beauty of coming in here and letting people see, you know, your butt hanging out a little bit because then you're watching them. God, they made it through. Look at them. Because then, you know, a year from now, that newcomer's got, hey, someone here went through the exact same thing. I mean, we are a community um, about saving each other. So, hey. All right, and we'll have a guy. We'll have a guy. Hi, Joe. Hi, Joe. Well, it says promptly in step 10. Promptly admit it. It doesn't say think about it for a year. Um, and I didn't really know Chuck C. I mean, I got to hear him speak and stand by him and have him show me where God was and things like that. But, um, um, but you know, a new pair of glasses is not conference approved, um, but it's a great book. Um, and he was, uh, you know, a pretty amazing man in that he gave, he gave back a lot of his spirit, you know, to us in those smoke-filled rooms where you couldn't see anybody and, you know, just an opinion, emphysema killed him. So every night he was in those rooms uh, breathing our smoke. Um, and, you know, I, I mean, there's, I'm not going to split hairs with you. You know, I'm not. I mean, there's nothing like my first fourth step. It was the first time I ever did anything like that, that hard ever, 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 ever. It was the hardest, biggest thing I had done, ever. And I almost ran from it, but ever. So there will no, not be another experience like that first one. 
because it was perfect for where I was. And, you know, as I go through life, yeah, when I finally gave up the keys of the car and my sponsor said, you'll walk through this with dignity and grace so you can be an example to others, which Jill, when he left her, came to me later and said, I knew I could walk through, you know, being cheated on and being left with a baby boy because you had done it. And so, you know, it's none of my, I don't get to pick and choose who gets my experience at all. But, um, yeah, I had to go back and, and write a pretty thorough one at the time about what was going on and look at my part. I mean, when I'm betrayed, it's not me at all. It took me a long time to see my part in the end of that marriage. Um, and he was very wise to have me do that. And then he was very wise. <clears throat> we work with their sponsor. He was very wise to have me sponsor this girl who um, <clears throat> got caught with somebody in the program marriage ended. She was much like the other woman. And my sponsor called me up one day and said, I'm going to have this girl from Kansas call you and you're going to sponsor her. I said, no, I'm not. 